stop Exeter. Hi, I'm Paul Nicholson. Thank you for joining us here on Next Stop Exeter. I'm on a power trip this week, and who better to speak about power with than Alec O'Meara, who's the Media Relations Director for our friends at Unitil in Hampton. Alex, welcome. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Well, we've got a, a wealth of topics to speak about today, and perhaps the best one to speak about is the letter I got in the mail uh, in January. <laughs> January's a tough month for most people in Exeter when it comes to bills. Get the credit card bill for Christmas, mm. and I got my electric bill. And my electric bill was a little bit higher than it normally is. Yep. And uh, first, I attribute that to uh, all the uh, Christmas lights. But it uh, appears as though I had a bit more than just Christmas lights going on. What can you tell us about the, the latest news in uh, 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 the electric rates? Sure, Paul. Well, first of all, let me tell you, you're not alone. Uh, this is an issue that is not just impacting Unitil customers. It's an issue that is impacting, really, the majority of New England. Um, let me let me take a step back and explain a little bit about what Unitil is and how you get the electricity at your house. Uh, Unitil is what's called a distribution utility. What that means is uh, we are uh, we're, our job is to get the electricity from outside of our service territory to your doorstep. We are the poles you see on the street. We are the wires. We are the trucks. When you lose power, we're the folks that come out and get that power back on to you. What we don't do, and this is as required in the state regulations, is generate electricity. We own no generation assets, no power plants of every, any kind. Uh, the reason for that is it's, it's about giving you, as the customer, an opportunity to basically be your own electricity broker if you so choose. So what that means is for you to get your electricity, we are required every six months to go out and get the market rate of electricity for our customers. That rate changes every six months. So if you look at your bill or if you look at your website, there's really kind of two parts to that. There's the distribution part, which is us, and that hasn't changed. And then you have the supply part, which literally changes every six months. Usually, it doesn't change by all that much. It might go up to a couple cents, it goes down a couple cents, but overall, it doesn't have a huge change one way or the other with the exception of course for this winter and effective December 1 the market rate of electricity went up by quite a bit it went from about seven or eight cents per kilowatt hour up to in the neighborhood of 14 or 15 cents per kilowatt hour that's a change of maybe seven cents per kilowatt hour which might not sound like a lot but the average homeowner probably uses about 600 kilowatt hours of electricity a month. So that could be an impact of as much as 30 or $40 in one month's time, even if you're using the same amount of electricity you did this month as opposed to this month a year ago. Uh, it has to do with the market rate of electricity, and it's not unique to us. So even though the, the, the cost on a kilowatt basis doubled, that doesn't mean your bill doubles, correct? That is correct. This is only one part of your bill. It's the part where the increase occurred, but it doesn't represent your entire bill. Uh, the distribution piece makes up uh, another good chunk of it. Probably the supply part usually makes up somewhere between 50 to 60 percent of your total bill. So, I mean, it's not like people's bill doubled, but $30 is a real change, and I understand that, and we all at Unitil understand it. We don't want this for our customers, and I think what's important to understand is this isn't something we benefit from as a business. That increase, it's not like we are doing that and it's somehow we are benefiting or profiting from it in any way. It's what we are required by the regulations to go out, get that market rate of electricity. It will be in place from December 1 through to, I believe it's May 31, and then we'll go out to bid again, and the market rate of electricity will change again. Uh, you may be wondering why. Why has this big change occurred this particular winter time? And there's a couple reasons for that. 
Uh, first and foremost, uh, a couple power plants in New England have come offline. Uh, there's uh, Yankee, which is a nuclear plant in Vermont that's no longer producing electricity. There's also a couple coal plants in Massachusetts that have come offline. So today, the majority of electricity in New England is generated by natural gas. And natural gas is, there's a bit of a bottleneck going on in New England right now. Uh, and this was discovered last winter when it got very, very cold. And what that means is, is on the very, very cold days when folks are using natural gas to heat their homes, mm -hmm. power plants, which operate on what's called the spot market because you can't generate electricity and then store it for later, you have to generate it every day, are buying that natural gas on the market as it happens. So there isn't enough natural gas coming into New England on the existing pipelines to meet that demand. So you saw power plants having to scramble a little bit to meet the energy needs of the region as a whole in order to avoid rolling blackouts and things like that. It's supply and demand. There was a, a tremendous demand for the natural gas, but the supply wasn't there. There's plenty of natural gas in, in the country. Uh, there's been this tremendous domestic revolution in regards to natural gas and the availability of it as a resource. But there's only so many pipelines coming into New England. So that bottleneck sort of has caused this price issue. It's expected to be seasonal. Uh, it, it's expected that when we get to the summertime again, when folks aren't heating with natural gas, that price will come down and you'll see somewhere more around the range that we've been in before. That's what people are, are kind of expecting, speculators. I try not to ex speculate on principle. I find that when you speculate, you're just setting yourself up for how wrong you're going to be later. But by and large, people seem to believe that this is a seasonal issue and we'll see something different maybe this summer. And then we might see the same thing again next winter. But we've had this change in the local electric generation dynamic that has created these higher supply rates in the short term. Am I, does that make sense to you? It does. Okay. So these suppliers, yes. let's say it's Schiller Station yeah. or Seabrook, people are actually producing the power. Yes. Are there what I'll call spot rates different or do they have to be the same when you purchase them? Do you have the ability to shop between producers of power? Yes. Well, what we're required to do is we, we are required by state regulations to have a portfolio. So they, they say you want to make sure you have a good diversified amount and included in that they say a set percentage of your electric load needs to be renewables, so on and so forth. So that's exactly what we do. We go out and we ask for bids and we get bids from the power suppliers and then we try and get the best market rate we can for our customers. And then once we go through that process, we then have to present what we did, our bids, to the state regulators and the state regulators look at that and they go, yep, you did what you could and then that becomes part of the rate and they, it's a set period of time and it's a set date that we're supposed to go out and get these bids. It's all highly regulated. So, and, and that's to make sure that the process remains competitive and, and upstanding with, with power suppliers and all of that. Power suppliers go through what's called ISO New England and the ISO New England is the entity that is responsible for making sure there is enough electricity for the entirety of the New England region and their job is on a day-to-day -day basis to monitor capacity and make sure all the power plants are working together to make sure that there's always being enough electricity generated to meet the needs of the region as a whole. I see. So in terms of the actual producers of power, mm -hmm. is it easier to get power in the winter or is it easier to get power in the summer? Because clearly you need more power in the summer than you do in the winter, mm -hmm. but in the winter it may be harder to get power. Um, when you look at some, something like um, uh, the Northern Pass, which is hydro, mm -hmm. which I'm assuming you can't get the hydro from Quebec in the middle of the winter because everything's frozen. I, I actually don't know about that. Yep. I'm, I'm not really familiar with how hydropower works. I think actually you, can, you might be able to get underneath the ice in those types of situations. Okay. I'm not entirely sure. Um, what I do know is that, um, I'm sorry, I lost track of the question. Basically, you're, oh, summer versus yeah. winter time. Uh, historically, summer has been where you see energy crunches. And that's because people use more sure. electricity in the summer than yep. winter. People have air conditioners. They're running those things on full blast when it gets hot. The hottest days of the year are typically the days where the most electricity is used in New England. The new issue is in the winter time, you have competition between the people generating electricity with natural gas and the people who are heating their homes with natural gas. Those two factors combining are what's creating that bottleneck. Now, interestingly, that has no impact on the folks that heat with natural gas. 
natural gas heating is still very competitive compared to oil, and you really haven't seen the price spikes that you're seeing on the electric side. The reason for that is that when it comes to those pipelines, people who heat actually get first crack at that gas supply. So that's, that's part of why that works. But it's the competition, it's the spot market after those, all those heating customers are taken care of that is creating the price swings that you're seeing. Last winter was where it really manifested itself. You might remember all the talk about polar vortexes yes. and so on and so forth, or you might just remember it was really, really cold. Uh, that in itself created a lot of this scrambling. Uh, it was even colder than it was this winter, and that's where you saw some really, really high prices on the spot market. Uh, most folks didn't see an impact on that in their electric bills because we do this six-month contract thing. So while the power suppliers and people that had to buy electricity every day might have been paying three times, four times as much as they were used to paying for electricity, most people didn't see it last winter. This winter, the power companies all said, well, we saw what happened last winter, and when the market when they were setting their rates, expecting what they were going to see for this winter again, they sort of built that into it. And I think that's a big part of what you're seeing in the, this winter's rates. Concern about this pipeline capacity issue again rearing its head. Gotcha. So as it relates to supply and demand, Unitil mm -hmm. has, uh, has companies very much like it here in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. uh, PSNH would be an example, which serves local communities here, who's now known as Eversource. Yes, they are. And, um, are they able to buy power for less than Unitil just because of the scale of the company? PSNH is the exception to the rule. PSNH actually still owns power plants. So unlike pretty much everyone else in New England, they have a power, power plants on hand that ends up meaning that their supply rate is a little bit more consistent month to month, year to year, than it might be to what we have seen over the past five years. Um, th that cuts both ways. Right now, they are lower than what the market rate of electricity was. Maybe a couple years ago, uh, natural gas was at record lows. They were a little bit higher than what the market rate was. So it, it, they're the one that's a little different. Everyone else, though, is exa in exactly the same boat. NSTAR and National Grid, the two largest uh, power suppliers in Massachusetts, their supply rates are exactly where ours are, uh, maybe a little bit higher. Um, so the fact that they're buying a lot more isn't really having an impact on them. It's just what the market rate is right now. Gotcha. So as it relates to portfolio yes. of, uh, of providers, uh, you may be interested to know that Exeter High School is yes. a provider of electricity. Yes, they are. They have a net metering facility. So Unitil, in theory, is a customer of the Exeter High School. <laughs> yeah, you could say it that way. So our lights and cameras here are all uh, run potentially by power generated right here on site. There you go. Well, please don't go away. Come back for more. Alex is going to come back and answer some questions as it relates to our great Thanksgiving Day uh, power outage. Don't go away. Thank you. Welcome. Joining us here in the studio today is Alec O'Meara from Unitil. Uh, Alex here to speak about Thanksgiving 2014 and uh, how Unitil supports the community. Alec, thanks for coming to the studio. Thanks for having me, Paul. Thanksgiving Day 2014, sure. we got a little snow. A little bit. We didn't get much power. No. <laughs> so we'd love to find out more about how Unitil handles customers' inquiries regarding how they get their power back. Sure. Well, um, first of all, I believe for context with the Thanksgiving storm, uh, Public Service New Hampshire has, has said that is the fourth largest storm as far as power outages in the region. Um, it seems to be the latest in what has been a series of very severe weather events that we've seen uh, in New Hampshire over the past five years. Superstorm Sandy was one of those. Uh, a very serious October snowstorm that happened within the past couple years. Tropical Storm Irene is another one of those. So for better or worse, we've seen a number of these very, very large weather events pass through. Uh, with the Thanksgiving storm, uh, for us, a storm like that actually begins probably about two, three days in advance of it. We uh, constantly get weather forecasts from uh, independent forecasting service, so we get to see what we're going to see coming up, and they, we give them a variety of thresholds that we say, if we see this kind of weather, we know that might cause trouble. So two, three days out in advance of that storm, they started talking about the volume of wet, heavy snow that we would see with that storm. Snow by itself in the dead of winter is not a really usually an issue. It's very dry, it's light, it's fluffy, it blows all over the place, it spits out of the snowblower, it hits you in the face, it doesn't stick to anything. Um, when you get to sort of the elbows of the season, say late in the fall or, or early, early in the spring, the snow takes on a very wet, 
sticky, oatmeal, sticks to everything kind of stuff. And that's the kind of snow that we saw on Thanksgiving. Uh, when we see a wet, heavy snow like that, a lot of snow falling very close to freezing, then it sticks to everything. And we got about a foot of that stuff. And it took down all kinds of branches, trees, all that sort of stuff. Trees that are otherwise very healthy and wouldn't be impacted by snow like that. So we saw that coming and we started our preparation plan. Everybody at UNITO has a second job, a storm job. So someone in accounting might suddenly be someone that's laying out pylon cones when we know uh, we're going to have to have a staging area set, stuff like that. We're Thank calling you. out to independent third-party contractors, seeing who's available, if they can come in, when they might be able to show up, build out our existing staff, bolster it with additional folks so we have the bodies on hand in the event we have to see a major weather event. Gotcha. So those are the things we're doing in advance of the storm. And then overnight Wednesday night was when the storm hit. So everyone just sort of buckles up and we see what kind of snow we're going to get and how much snow we're going to get. Uh, the forecast had been for about four to eight inches, maybe a little bit more of wet, heavy snow. We ended up seeing a foot. So it ended up being even exceeding the forecast that folks were talking about at the time. We were putting out press releases, letting folks know that this was what's going to be happening, uh, that we had the potential for some outages with that event, but overnight, what we saw was what we saw, and it became a very serious, serious situation. So right away, we're on the phone, we're saying, okay, we want even more crews. So we called up Canada. We had Canada come down. We, they were able to send us a, a, a wide contingent of crews. Thankfully, Thanksgiving isn't Thanksgiving in Canada, yes. so they had some folks it's that were It's in October. Available. It yes. is in October, yes. So they brought some folks down, um, and then the calls start coming in, and that's a key part of the restoration process for me when folks start calling in with those calls. Um, it's basically, uh, the calls give us an indicator when someone is out. That's still the, it's the oldest method and it's still the best method. What happens is when someone calls, it goes right into the system and we have uh, software and basically it puts that address up and then we get more calls and more calls from a specific location. And then we get to see it sort of paints a picture as to where folks might be without power and we can go, aha, there's where we need to make the fix. So we can send a truck out and we can get the fix done there. When you have a big storm, everybody's calling because there's a lot of folks that are without power. So we're seeing a variety of calls come in. Um, we have a map online, you can actually see this happen. There's all these little bubbles that start showing up for potential outages. So that's, that's what's happening in the first 12, 18 hours of an event like that. We're getting out, we're restoring power where we can, but if you think of electric infrastructure as like a tree, where say the backbone of the system are the biggest lines, the high tension lines, and then you go out to smaller lines, lines that go out to individual towns or neighborhoods, and then streets, and then homes, and then, so it really kind of looks like a tree if you think about the electric infrastructure in that way. You're seeing issues kind of happen all over that tree. So then we gotta get the folks out and we start doing the restoration. So in, in a nutshell, that's how we prepare and what we're looking at in the early stages of those storms. Does it help if a consumer who does not have electricity, they've called once, mm -hmm. said what their address is, yep. if they don't get power in an hour or yep. two hours, if they call again, or is that just a waste of their time and your time? One hour, two hours out, no. That, there, there's no reason to call again if your power is out at that time. We will be updating our on hold message. There might be some new information. You can listen to the on hold message. If there's anything new in those first few hours, that's where we'll that, have that information. But once your outage is logged, then we have it in the system. We can, we can plan accordingly from there. However, if we get toward the end of a restoration, say we're down to the last handful of folks that were without power, we then encourage anyone who is still without power at that time to call us again. And the reason for that is the potential of an outage within an outage. Let's say we know this whole street is without power. So we get a guy out there and they do a fix and they bring that street back on. We might not be aware of an individual issue inside of that street where someone, say, has the line down on their individual home. We got all the calls on that street. We know the streets without power. We make the fix. We might go on. We need someone, if it's called a nested outage, an outage within an outage. If there's a situation like that, a cluster of folks that are without power, say you see your whole street come on, you're still out, that's a time you should call again. Gotcha. So you mentioned earlier that you have crews from all over, that's outside correct. of New Hampshire, mm -hmm. come to, to assist you. Yes. Unitil's headquartered in Hampton. Correct has an operation in Kensington. Correct. That operation in Kensington is the one that actually sends out trucks to yep. service local accounts. Yep. Um, you have a crew from, say, Vermont mm -hmm. or Maine or Massachusetts that come here who aren't familiar with the terrain. Sure. 
How do you communicate with them? Are you sending them emails, texts, saying go to this neighborhood? How do they know where to go? Oh, we do a couple different things. Um, one of the things we do um, in the early going when we're sort of in that right in the thick of it at the beginning, we're conducting what's called a damage assessment. So we're getting out folks out already so we can bird dog the whole system and we can see who's without power, who's not, where's the fix, drive down that street, okay, we got a broken pole there, we got a transformer there that needs to get fixed, find out where all the things are. So that way when we're starting folks out, we can give out lists. These people are gonna go run that way. These people are gonna go run that way. We can figure out what's going on. Also, we're doing math at that time. We know what each of those individual trouble spots are. We know roughly how long each of those jobs are gonna take, and we know the manpower that we have. So we divide the hours of work that we have by the manpower, and we figure out how long it's gonna to take to get everyone back online. When folks are wondering during that first day, well, why can't they tell me how long it's going to take? We're doing that damage assessment, we're doing the math. We're trying to figure out exactly all the troubles and dividing by the people we have to determine when we can safely say we'll have everyone back on. So that's why that delay occurs. To make sure those folks, when they get that list in hand, know where they're going, we do a couple things. Um, we talk with them ahead of time, we take our own crews, Oftentimes the folks we have locally might become crew guides and they'll work closely with a group of folks, make sure they go out with them, be a resource because they have the local knowledge of where things are. Another thing that often happens is uh, recent retirees, uh, they step up, they, they give us a call or we call them and say, hey, listen, we need some more folks with local knowledge and they serve in that crew guide capacity as well. So we do have folks that have local knowledge in the event we do have someone come in from Canada or Ohio or Michigan and then once they've come, we try and call them again first because they already have a little bit of knowledge on our system and for better or worse, there's been a bunch of these things. So uh, we, we build some good relationships and, and we, we have some folks that are really able to help us out. So you actually have local folks who act as, for lack of a better term, guides yeah. for outside crews mm -hmm. to assist them in locating where these locations are, where the outages yeah. are. Yeah, and I mean, you know, they, they get the general idea as far yep. as how to restoration, and they come equipped with GPSs. They, they, you know, they're professionals, and they know how to get around, but we do have resources that are available for them. Gotcha. So in Exeter, where basically the entire town is out, mm. uh, you, you will see certain neighborhoods that appear to always get their power before other neighborhoods. Sure. Is there some hierarchy within the town, whether it's downtown, whether it's the academy, whether it's the hospital, mm -hmm. that kind of rises to the top of the pecking order to make sure that they get their power first? Sure. It's not a pecking order, but there is a system that is used to restore power. And again, like I talked about how if you think of electric infrastructure as like a tree, well, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using those crews to restore the most people we can with the smallest fixes. In other words, if we have a fix that we can bring on 10,000 people and we have a fix that will bring on five people, we're going to do that 10,000 person fix first. So if you, again, picture that tree, the first thing we're going to try and do is restore the trunk of that tree. The fixes we can make that bring on the core of the electric system and, and get thousands of folks on, that's what's going to happen first. Then we're going to go to branches, and branches are going to be another step removed. And then we're going to go out to branch, uh, like branches off of branches, neighborhoods, streets, and then eventually we'll get out to the twigs, which might be individual clusters of homes. So there is sort of a core to the system that we are looking to repair first because we want to get folks back on. Typically, critical infrastructure like hospitals is close to that core for very reasonable sure. reasons. Sure. So that might be why you might hear folks say a hospital gets their power back first because we're restoring the trunk of that tree so that we know once that fix is made, when we make the fix further out, it'll actually do something. If we do the ones out on the twigs first and the yep. trunk's not whole, it's not gonna do anybody any good. So gotcha. we gotta get those ones in here first and then build out from there. Gotcha. So that's why you might see neighborhood X says, oh, we lose power all the time. They might be way out on the out outside of that tree so that anything that happens here, 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 here might cause an outage. Gotcha. Whereas say someone right here, there's only like maybe maybe a few miles of line where they might lose power. Gotcha. So that's why you could see that difference. It's not like we're playing favorites, it's just how things are built. Gotcha. All right, Alec O'Meara from Unitil, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, glad to be here, thank you. Thank you for joining us on this electric episode of Next Stop Exeter. Look forward to joining us in two weeks for a new episode. Till then, I'm Paul Nicholson. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.